want to tell you a story about maybe my strangest speech. I'm sitting in my office maybe four years ago, and I get a call from a woman, and as soon as she picked, I spoke to her, I knew this was going to be an adventure. She was from Buford, Georgia, and I said, she said, hello. I said, hello. She goes, hello. My name is Betsy. Is there a Mr. Hooray there? I'm like, almost, one more R. She's like, well, Mr. Hooray, my name is Betsy, and I'm calling from Buford, Georgia. I'm like, I can tell from your accent. She goes, would you like to come and speak at our conference? I said, well, what's the name of your conference? She goes, it is the Christian Coalition of Technology. I said, you sure you got the right number? She's like, well, yeah, you are a minister, aren't you? I'm like, no. She's like, well, you're a rabbi, right? I'm like, not a rabbi. She goes, hmm, well, are you at least a Jew? I was like, yes. She goes, that'll be just fine. And I said, uh, okay, I mean, what is it? She goes, we want you to come down, be our guest at our conference. And, you know, I'm like, okay, like, I don't like, you know, I've never been to be before, I've never been sort of there. I'm like, you know what, let me just ask my rabbi and say goodbye to my family and uh, <laughs> go to Buford. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if you can have me for lunch. I don't know. So I go, before I, before I let you go, how did you find me? She goes, I watched one of your videos on a great website called Aish.com. <laughs> awesome. I said, okay. So I asked my rabbi, and I said goodbye to my family. <laughs> and I boarded a flight to Atlanta and got picked up by a car and drove out to Buford. Anyone here been to Buford before? Why would you? <laughs> Buford's a wonderful town. And at least what I saw at Buford, it's long patches of grass, lots of churches, football fields, and gun shops, which is just perfect. So I'm going in a church, gun shop, football field, church, gun shop, football field. I'm like, this is going to be an incredible day. And at the end of this long, long road, there was a small little hotel. And I got out of the car, and I walked into this conference. It wasn't a major hotel. And I kid you not, the conference would have been a conference that you could see in one of our communities. The conference is about technology and how technology could impact faith on children. Like, we could literally have had the same thing. And I walk into this room, and the room is packed. And there's three presenters. There's an evangelical minister. But I want you to picture this guy. He's like 35, good looking, short haircut, and he is like in the dictionary. If you look at like charisma, you'd see his picture. He's like, he comes in the room and the room just lights up. He's walking, he owns the place. Next to him is a Southern Baptist minister, African American man. Like the energizer bunny. And then there's me, the Jew from Long Island. And the conference begins. So let me, give, let me give you, for those of you who aren't familiar, I wasn't familiar, the way it works, in the Jew, if you speak to a Jewish audience, you get up here and you give yourself, and you sweat this out. The rabbi gets up there and gives a drush and sweats it out. If you're lucky, after an hour for a Jewish audience and they like what you say, we say, shkayach. <laughs> shkayach is short for yasher koach, but God forbid should we say two words. <laughs> Let me turn it into like one word, which is like a, a half like you're coughing. Shkayach. Shkayach. So when the rabbi's done, his whole suit is drenched with phlegm for all the shkayach, shkayach, shkayach. That, that, that's it. You get a shkayach? That's the gold standard in the Jewish world. Not in the evangelical world. If they like what you say in the middle of their speech, they will scream out mid-speech, Amen. Just in the middle. Amen. If they really like what you're saying, I don't know how they do it. They have like this weird like ESP. They say, mm-hmm, but not one person, like four, five, ten people. I don't know how they all know to start mm-hmm together, but they do. And you'll get a collective mm-hmm. He gets up there, and this guy just kills it. I mean, he 
kills it. He is quoted every single prophet, and they are loving him. They are amening him. They are mm-hmoming him. He's, ta- he's, I forget, he's talking about David and the rock of David. Although it is small, it'll slow the big Goliath. The internet may be big, but it's our faith that makes us work because David has the name of the Lord, and you never met. And they are going out of their minds. They're amening. They're mm-homing. He is dancing with them. I am sweating. I've never seen this in my whole life. And he sits down. Like it's like a regular day for me. Then the Southern Baptist gets up. Holy cow, if you think the evangelicals are fun, forget it. Southern Baptist, you've got amen and mm-hmm. Then you've got extra credit words. If they like what you say, after they've gone through amens and mm-hmms, they will stand up and they will put their hands up and they will say, preach on my brother in the middle people just stand up and they it's unbelievable this guy forget about it he's like but he's quoting guys he's not quoting our people he's quoting matthew and luke i don't know who these people like it's not one of ours but he knows them chapter and verse and he's quoting and he's dancing and the people are up in the aisles amens mm-hmm, preach on he is dancing with them i am like dripping in the corner the evangelical's not moved whatsoever and he's rocking and he sits down and then it's my turn <laughs> and i get up and say in this week's parsha it says <laughs> i didn't do that I didn't. it doesn't work in shul it's gonna work down there I get up and I'm like, I tell a high prepared a whole thing about the idea of what we would consider to be like dear Batachtonim, have to uh, physical, it was supposed to elevate it, you know, spirituality doesn't mean non-physical, it means the elevation of physical, and I do a whole speech about how there's something in this world that can be a potential tool for God, and I am getting no amens. <laughs> I am getting no mm-hmms, and you can be sure I am not getting any Preach on my brothers. And it's uncomfortable, you understand? It's been a half an hour of a total dance fest, and the Jew boy's up there, and it's like a library. And I'm going out of my mind. I'm like, I don't understand. I was like, I prepared, and I'm going, and the, the problem was that I'm from New York. And when you're from New York, you talk as fast as the words come out of your mouth. Because the minute you stop, someone's barreling right over you. In the South, that's not how it works. You gotta talk slowly and you gotta give them a runway to get the amen. And I didn't know that. And there was no handbook for if you're a Jew and you end up in a Christian place, how do you get an amen? No one taught me that in school. And I'm like dying. I'm going out of my mind. And I'm going and I'm trying. And at some point I'm like, you know, Hashem, whatever. I don't need an amen. I'll just get, I'll just live with shkayachs. If that's my lot in life, to just get a bunch of shkayachs, fine. I'm a kabel, all of your, all of your judgments. I'll go back to New York and I'll live with Flemish Shkayachs. And I'm going, thank you. And I'm going and I'm, just, and I'm just into it. I'm like letting go and I'm talking about this time. You have to elevate what we have and do it for the, for the sake of God. And I take a breath because I'm exhausted. And in the corner of the room, a guy goes, Amen. And I'm like, Sir, I want to let you know something. I was up here the whole time, and I'm like, I'm not getting any amens. And I was getting a little subconscious, but I want to just thank you so much because I really appreciate your amen. And the crowd found out that this Jew boy wanted amens. (laughs) They amened me to death. And I was all in. I was like, and then they're like, like, amen. And I'm like, and can I get an amen? Like, amen. I'm like, can I get a... "Mm -hmm." So they had to preach on, and they're standing in the aisles. They're amening me. They're, it was the best day of my life. I called my wife. I said, Dina, we are moving to Buford. She's like, what about Jewish schools? I'm like, forget the Jewish schools. They amen you down here. So the conference is over. I didn't want to leave, but apparently it was over. 
And I had booked a flight from Delta that was like leaving, I don't know, 9 o'clock at night. So they put me into a room to, for, for a flight, and I told them that I'm kosher. They're like, what do you eat? I'm like, just get me a few pieces of fruit. And they went all out. Like they bought every single piece of fruit in the entire state of Georgia. So it's me, a little conference room, and the Garden of Eden. In one time. <laughs> so I'm sitting in the room, Wi-Fi, and just pounding fruit. About 10 minutes later, the evangelical minister comes in. And he walks into the room, and he slowly closes the door. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> this is the moment. So he looks at me and goes, good job in there. I'm like, you, you get this all week? He's like, yeah, every time I speak, they usually, I'm like, wow. Talking for a few minutes, and then he gets really serious. And I'm like, no, 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 we don't put blood in the matzahs. That's not how it works. <laughs> <laughs> this whole thing is made up, and we're good people. It's not like that. I'm like, what? So he looks at me and he says, I know. I'm like, what? He's like, I know. I'm like, I'm so so happy that you know. Um, Because I guess you think that I know too. So you know and I know. So let's just at the same time say who we know. You go first. (laughs) So he says, about you people, I know. I'm like, okay. What is it about our people in particular, if you wouldn't mind, that you want to start with that you know? So he says, you know, I grew up and I was always a man of faith. My grandfather had a ministry, my father had a ministry, and I knew right away when I was going, I was going straight to the ministry. I love the Lord, I love the Bible. And he, this guy can quote chapter and verse like I've never seen. He's quoting Zechariah. I, 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 I don't even know half the stuff that he's saying. I'm just like, you're probably right, I just gotta look at the Hebrew. <laughs> he goes, but I gotta tell you something. When, I was in, when I'm in my church, I always have this thought that somehow God hooks you people up. Something about you and God. He's always hooking you up. And it always bothered me. It seems like God is always taking care of the Jewish people. And one, once I got to a certain level in his ministry, he was able to take his first trip to Israel. And I took a mission to Israel. On the last day of the mission, my tour guide said, tomorrow we're going to see the most sacred place right now in the world for the Jewish people, the Western Wall. This is the last remnant of their temple. And tomorrow we're going to go there and be able to pray. And he thought, thank God I have this tour guard because it's probably close to the public. But this guy can like hook us up and get us in. <laughs> so the day came and I woke up in the morning and I got to tell you, I was sorely disappointed. I expected to see nobody there except for a few really holy Jews. The place was open to the public. Every, I saw group of people taking pictures, kids were dancing, tourists were snapping pictures. The one thing you have left, the most sacred place you have on earth, you don't cord it off, you don't seal it up, it's open to anybody who wants to walk in. How could that possibly be? And I was so upset, and on the way out, I asked the tour guard, how could it possibly be that this is the Jews' last remnant of their holy temple, the most sacred place they have on earth, and they don't keep it for themselves? They open it up to anybody that wants to walk in, it's public property? Isn't that a desecration? The tour guide said, no, you don't understand how it works. The temple was the place in which God dwelled in this earth. And we don't believe that God belongs to us. We want the whole world to know he exists. In fact, that temple was a place that they used to bring sacrifices. Even non-Jews would bring sacrifices in that temple. Because this is the God we want the whole world to see. So if anything, when we have a place of the temple, we want people to come in and tap into a little bit of divineness. And as I walked out, I realized why God hooks you up. Because you're his people. And you're tasked with bringing him to the world. So since you're working for the the man, you might as well get company benefits. This is what you do. Your job is bringing him into the world. So I understand if you're bringing him into the world, you deserve to have certain benefits. So I got on that plane, and I got to tell you, I had a very interesting flight home. Because part of me was so proud to be a Jew. Like, I'm a nobody. I got a call from somebody. So it's funny, because as I walked out, I go, how did you get me? He goes, when I got back from Israel, I told my secretary, I'm like, Betsy? She's like, yep, Betsy. Uh And I said, I told my secretary, we're doing a conference about technology, my first conference. Get me a Jew. (laughs) He said, I'm like, I'm happy I was the one. <laughs> Thank God for Aish.com. <laughs> I got on that plane, and I got to tell you, I had mixed feelings. 
part of me was so proud. I'm a regular nobody, and yet I'm part of a people that's so glorious that some guy in Buford comes back from the greatest state in the world, the greatest country in the world, and because I happen to be born as a Jew, because I happen to be a Jew, I'm connected to this nation. A part of me felt like, is he even right? Are we really that nation? If someone would look into our lives, would they say, oh, these are the people that work for God all day? If somebody saw how we acted and spoke and what we did and our goals, would they say, oh, of course, this, these are God's people? I almost feel like we're like in the tale of two cities, you know? On the one part, it's never been easier and greater to be a Jew. My grandmother used to tell me stories where when she first came to America and she was working as a seamstress, she'd go to work and they would tell her, if you don't work on Saturdays, don't show up on Mondays. And she'd get fired every week. My first job was with a very waspy firm in New York. Like I said earlier, I, I, first thing I did, I'm from Brooklyn, I wanted to work in the waspiest firm ever. When I went for my first job, I'm like, I need wasps. I have to compensate. You know what I'm talking about? I want a firm with mahogany walls. I want guys with Roman numerals after their names. I want people from the Mayflower. My first week in the thing, I'll never forget the orientation. I walk in, they tell me, welcome to our firm. We're going to pay you a lot of money, and you're going to work really hard. I'm like, oh, yeah, about the whole... <laughs> About the whole hardworking thing, I'm like, it is October, you know what I'm saying? So next week's Rosh Hashanah, so I'll be out on, um, yeah, it's Tuesday, Wednesday this year, so I'll be out Tuesday, Wednesday. I'm like, that's okay. I'm like, oh, yeah. And I, I turn to a pumpkin at night when, it, when the clock strikes sunset, so I'll be out in the afternoon on Monday. They're like, that's okay. We heard Rosh Hashanah. I'm like, oh, and then the next week's home care, but like, yeah, we heard that too. I'm like, oh, then the fun just begins. <laughs> I'll be sitting in a booth for eight days. So how about I see you in December? And they're like, okay, 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 right? My grandfather told me stories about when he was in Munkach and he was in importing, that's what he did. He had a, a little wagon. He would go to another town and he would spend a week or wherever he went and he would bring with him bread and water. And that's what he ate. Because when we traveled, there was no kosher food. Today, when I travel, every time I go to a rest stop, to my brain, if it's in a package at this point, it should be kosher. You ever get that feeling when I'm traveling and I'm like, there's got to be an OU on it at some place. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I'm in the, I'm in the restaurant and I'm like, looking at the package, I'm like, it's got to be kosher, right? It's got a package. And I'm like, how come there's no OU? Like, what does the OU do all day? It's a package. There should be to be kosher. My wife's like, Charlie, it says pork chips on it. <laughs> I'm like, they can't make pork kosher by now? What do the rabbis do all day? They should be making, there shouldn't be food anymore. We walk into a room, like, I don't think, if there's food, they should figure out how to make that kosher. I kind of feel like everything we can want. You get on, online, there's everything you want to learn. Every time someone wants to grow, we go to Israel in a couple of hours, we run tri The entire, if you look, if you speak to your great grandparents or your grandparents and tell them that we're sitting in the middle of diaspora and we're, we're under 15 hours from the Kotel on demand, you get to log on and watch it live, any sheer, anything you want to know at any point at any time, they look at you and go like, are you on drugs? Everything is available. And with all of that, do we really feel like we're killing it as a nation? Do we feel like we are killing it? Like we are the, the light that we should be? Do we feel that way? If I would turn to my great grandparents and I'd say, you see how much God gave us? Look what we do with it. We're the light that we've, we've always, do we feel like that? How come? So I believe there's a bunch of reasons, but I believe there's one in particular. I think there's one reason why we have so much, but yet we're missing something. And I think it has to do with this month. We are entering into the month of Adar. This week, on Thursday and Friday, we will enter into Adar. We're already in Adar, but we're going to get into the real, so to speak, the Adar Shein. And the month of Adar, there's a famous Mishnah, which turned into, then expounded into a Gemara. And the month of Adar, it says... You know it's famous because it's the song. When you come into the month of Adar, you have an increased amount of joy. And the question is, why? Why, when you come into Adar, do you have more joy? 
What is it about the month of Adar that makes you happier? Is it because we have holidays? Well, guess what? If you can wait a couple of months and you get to Tishrei, you have holidays every single week. If it's the holiday, just give it a couple of bits, and then you'll be able to have joy. If it's because God saves us, the story of Purim, where we almost died, and God showed up and saved us through the Haman, Esther, Mordechai move, i got to tell you something. If we can have a drop of patience and wait until Nisan, God saves us in so much of a better way. In one month from now, by Pesach, God uses grasshoppers and lice and blood and split seas. Like, it's so much more interesting in a, in a month. That should really be joy. How come? Adar is the month of happiness. By the way, if you think of Purim, by the way, don't you find, at least I thought, if you'd have to rank Purim, if you have to rank all the holidays from order of holiness, wouldn't Purim be like on the bottom? You know what I mean? Like, holy holidays are like Yom Kippur and Sukkot and Shavuos. God gives the Torah. Isn't like Purim like you have to like hang out and drink a little bit more? Could it possibly be that you come into the month of Adar because you get to drink on a holiday? Really? Could that possibly be that the rabbis are doing that? I got a buddy of mine, I'll never forget. I was in law school, we had a group of four people. We had a study group, three Orthodox Jews, and an Irish guy. This is the beginning of a bad joke. <laughs> Irish Catholic, strong Catholic, Irish. Irish barks from God bless them, they love to drink. Three, but he's, he was staunch. He was a very religious guy. And he's like, I want to find out more about Judaism. I'm like, it's okay. Like, he goes, I want to find out more about Judaism. I'm like, okay, it's fine, we got you. He goes, oh, no, no, I'm very interested in the, in the religion, I want to find out. We're like, okay, listen. We're studying for our, 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 our crim law. If we get an A in crim law, if we do well, the next holiday after the grade, you can come over. He goes, guaranteed? We're like, guaranteed. We took the, the finals in December. We got our grades in February. What's the next holiday after February? Purim. He comes rolling in on Purim. He's like, this is the best religion ever. I'm like, just wait for Yom Kippur. He's like, what's that? I'm like, just wait, my friend. Just wait. Could it be? Because we get to drink. Really? Rabbi's Irish now, for real? Why Mishnichnas Adar? Why is this month supposed to be the month where our joy increases? So it's hard to speak about Adar. It's hard to speak about this month unless we speak about maybe the most interesting and strange thing that we do. We do a lot of strange stuff. But there's one thing that I think is Ole Al Gobe. There's one practice that we have that I believe in my core is the strangest of all practices. And it involves our obsession with one people. We've had a lot of enemies in our lives. There are a lot of nations in our history that hate us. Just how it is. We need to be a Jew. People, this is how we roll. Throughout history, people look at us, they get threatened by us, they think we're, we're bad or good, we're, we're warmongers or we're peacemakers. And as a result, they hate us. And typically it follows a very simple pattern. People hate us. They try to kill us, God saves us, and then we turn them into food. That's usually how it works. <laughs> and out of all the people that hate us, there is one nation that we seem to be obsessed with. What nation is that? Amalek. There's a nation called Amalek, and it seems that we are so obsessed with them, and we're so obsessed with them that we actually give them a special Shabbos. The Shabbos is called Parsha Zahor, and it has to be that the Shabbos before Purim, you cannot go into Purim until you have a Shabbos dedicated for us to remember Amalek. It's called Parsha Zahor, the Shabbos of remembering. And what we do is that we walk into a room and basically, according to the Torah, you don't have to daven in a minion. The only time really midday or right, so you have to daven, it, we have to hear a minion, is to hear this one few sentence part of the Torah when we speak about this nation of Amalek. And when everybody comes to the shul and the rabbi goes, okay, we're going to have two readings and three readings and four readings. Oh no, guys, seriously quiet now. They're seriously quiet. Can you please everyone stand up? Everybody listen, pay attention. Ladies later, ladies earlier, guys, seriously, seriously, seriously. And the entire nation has to, according to Torah law, show up and we read that there is a nation called Amalek that tried to kill us. And we re read that we have an obligation to eradicate their memory. And we have to come together and remember them because it is our obligation to eradicate their memory. Anyone seeing the logical problem here? <laughs> Who here but for us even remembers Amalek? Nobody. 
They don't live anymore. They're not a nation anymore. It's over. They're gone. Nobody remembers them. You go on the street and go tell someone I'm like, they think you're cursing at them. They have no idea what you're talking about. And even we don't even know who they are. So we like make up people. The Nazis, a Malik. Guys who strapped bombs on themselves, a Malik. The guy who failed me in my road test, a Malik, for sure. <laughs> Two Jews are fighting. Medina, no Medina. Medina, no Medina. They're like, you're a Malik, you're a Malik. We don't know who a Malik is. We just find people to call a Malik because we got to find a way to write it. They don't exist anymore. It's over. We won. It's it. There's no groups. There's no shuls for Amalek. There's no trips in Amalek land for like a week called JW Amalek P, whatever. <laughs> there's no, there's no, the only nation. In fact, nobody even remembers them. They are eradicated from the entire world. The only nation who actually remembers Amalek is the nation who was charged with eradicating their memory. Anybody see a problem with this but me? Anyone bothered by this? With those that we remember is because we put them in the room. Had we leave them in the back of the room where they were before, where everybody's in the country or the cottages, we'd be like, our kids won't even remember them in a couple of years. The only people that still remember these people are the people that God charges with eradicating their memory. Anybody see a problem with this but me? What in the world are we doing? So I want to tell you a story. So I, I think in a previous life, I think I like was in some army. I'm almost positive that like I fought for like Bar Kokhba or something. Because I am like obsessed with the Israeli army. Like the whole concept of like fighting in Mossad, I don't know. For the guys who are on the trip, you know what I'm talking about. So because I'm not in it officially, I like follow a lot of like army blogs and conspiracy. And I'm not gonna do this, but am I the only one? Okay, it's okay, I can be the only one, it's all right. I was in Buford once, it's okay, I feel like I can be alone. And like I follow like what's going on, I try to figure out like Mossad, because I feel like, you know, you never know, you never know. They may need me one day. <laughs> The Mossad may be like, hey, Charlie, listen, we need some people. Do you mind hooking us up? And I want to be like up to date with what they're doing. So there's all these like Depka files. I don't know if you guys saw. There's all these different sites that you can go on to sort of see what the Mossad and what intelligence is doing. And I'm obsessed with it. I just am. So for those of you who are, who are following this, there is an enemy that we have now who has a very original idea. And their idea is, let's destroy the Jewish people. Incredibly original. And they think they're going to win. They're called Iran. Right? I just can't wait to see after they're gone what type of food we make with Iran, by the way. It's gonna be great. I'm sure it's gonna be Sephardi. Any Sephardi in the room? There's gonna be spices. There's gonna be hummus involved, I'm sure. It's gonna be delicious. Very fattening, but that's okay because we have mitzvahs and stuff like that. I love, by the way, how we figured to not only make our enemies and our miracles all food, but we somehow feel like God like hooks up the cow, you know what I'm talking about? Like God like God came in and helped us with oil to light the candle. We're like, oh, oil to light candles? Uh, let's eat oil as well. <laughs> God's like, no, 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 no. I use it for candles. We're like, no, it's okay, God, I got this. Why don't we deep fry everything for eight straight days? We get mitzvahs for, for eating oil, right? God's like, no, 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 that's okay. And not only that, but some bubby's like, oh, if you eat oil on Hanukkah, you don't get calories. You know what I mean? Like on Shabbos, the mala comes in. I just can't wait. Iran's going to be a great food, I'm telling you. It's going to be wonderful. Spicy, but it's okay. Calorie free, it's on God. Iran has this idea they want to kill the Jewish people. Here's what they do. They're building this nuclear bomb, and their idea is that they send the bomb into Israel, and they're going to destroy the Jewish people. It's awesome. So if you remember, if those who are following the program, like I am, and me and my, 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 my Mossad friends, the way we're following it is, in the beginning the program was going, and then all of a sudden, for two or three years, the program basically went offline, if anyone who's following this. And now it's making a resurgence. And you ask yourself, well, what happened? Why did it go offline for two and a half years? And the answer is because the Mossad and the CIA had a joint mission. And they actually went in to Iranian nuclear facilities and they planted in the facility a uh, virus called the Stuxnet virus, Google. And what they did was an Israeli spy got into the facility, planted the virus, and it was so sophisticated that any time the Iranians were able to target the virus, the virus split and multiplied. So over the course of just a few weeks or months, the entire nuclear facility was basically re reduced to just metal scraps. Now, Iran understood that Israel was going to be their enemy. And they also understood that in 1981, Iraq, their next door neighbor, had the same idea. And when Iraq built the facility, what the Israelis did is they sent in F-16s. Remember Ilan Ramon, the one who passed away? And he was one of the fire jets. There's a great book called Raid on the Sun, if you have never unbelievable how they did it. it was incredible. 
they, the fighter jets came in and they destroyed the facility and they got home untouched, thank God, and basically destroyed their program. So what Iran did was, Iran built around their facility the most sophisticated ground-to-air missiles that, that, that's available today. And they filled it with the best technology and they're sitting around waiting for the Israeli fighter jets. So if you can just picture for a few minutes with me, just enjoy this moment. Iranian guards controlling ground-to-air missiles waiting for Israeli fighter jets. It's probably screaming up in the sky, like, where are the Israelis? Oh, excuse me. I don't know what happened here. Where are the Israelis? You know, bring them on. You know what I'm talking about? Like, El-Jihad, El-Jihad, El-Jihad. You know what I'm talking about? And they're like, they're so scared, they're so weak, they're so wimpy. Where are all the Israelis? And meanwhile, behind them is a virus, probably being controlled by like two Israelis, like in a bunker in Demona. You know what I'm talking about? Two guys in a room, probably drinking Turkish coffee with the, the, the coffee, the dirt on the bottom. You know what I'm talking about? Like, dipping olives in hummus. <laughs> talking a million miles an hour. You know what I'm talking about? Yoni! <laughs> and they all know what they're saying. You know what I'm about? And meanwhile, they're controlling. Two Israelis are controlling, and these Israelis are like, they're so weak. They're so big. They're so weak. Where are they? Where are they? And the entire facility is probably crumbling behind them. I get so much joy just saying this, by the way. You know what the greatest mistake the Iranians made? Is the number one rule in warfare is that if your enemy changes its face, it doesn't mean he goes away. And when you pr pr prepare yourself to fight in front and you leave the back wide open, the back comes in and does more damage than what's right in front. Who was Amalek? Why do we care in 2019 about this nation that most people don't even know? So you have to understand who we are from the beginning of who we are. The Jewish people show up in the beginning out of Egypt. And one of the greatest mistakes that we make is that we think that the reason why God brought 10 plagues to Egypt was to get the Jews out. As if the creator of the world needed to bargain with Paro. As if God's like, can you pretty, pretty, pretty please? And Paro's like, no, I can't. And God's like, okay, blood. Now, my, my, and my power's like, not impressed yet. And he's like, okay, bring in the frogs. And God's like, I'm getting exhausted. And I'm reducing, I don't have any money left. And I have, I, I mean, like, and finally, after 10 rounds, power's like, okay. And God's like, oh, I just can't, can't do this my whole life. Guys, let's get out of here. As if the man that God created needs his permission to take his people out. Ten plagues, I can guarantee you, wasn't because Hashem, Hashem could have taken us out. Hashem could have told Moshe, here's the deal. On Tuesday afternoon, lights are out on, 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 on Mitzrayim. Egypt could have been blackened out, and the Jews could have been in Israel pounding shawarmas on Ben Yehuda Street before the lights went back up and the Egyptians go, where all the Jews go? We didn't need to play Paro's game. Why in the world did we go ten rounds with that man? And the reason is because of the following thing. At the time of Egypt, the entire world believed in power. There weren't atheists. Atheism is a relatively new invention. It began a little bit in the Greek Empire, but it's relatively new. Back in antiquity, people weren't atheists. They believed in power. They believed in, so to speak, gods. But they had one assumption of how power worked, how higher power worked. Higher power was there. They believed that the power was there, and you served the power. You sacrificed for the power, but the power was almost, they were almost agnostic to who you were. It didn't matter. They didn't care about you. They didn't know you. They just ran the sun or the wind or the stars or whatever it was that you served. The nations at the time, Egypt being the center of it, believed in a certain type of higher power, a divine power, a godly power. But they saw the godly power as being just the power that's on top. And God wanted to introduce who he really was. Because the way we interact with God is in two totally different dimensions. And they're both part of who he is. There's a piece of God that is high. That is the power that runs the world. That's what everybody understood. In our worlds, every single day, we say, well, our mission statement is Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu. We say Hashem Elokeinu because we're saying He is the power. But there's another aspect of God 
that is maybe even more crazy, maybe even more powerful, and that is he's not only a power that exists on top, he is a power that is in our lives. He's not just a king, but he's our dad. He's with us on carpool. He's in the boardroom. He's in our houses. He's with our children. We don't take a step without God. We don't take a breath without God. Everything we do, every aspect we are, and it doesn't matter if we're this religious or that religious, all that stuff. Hashem is not only Elokeinu, he is Echad. He is unity. He is everything. And there was a period of time where the whole world said that's impossible. And God chose Egypt. You know why? Because Egypt was the epicenter of the world. Right now, we're living in North America. North America is the epicenter of the world. If you go to, especially in America, by the way, if you go to uh, Europe and you ask Europe to follow American politics, everybody knows what's going on. You ask any of our children to name like 10 European cities, we're like, we have no idea. <laughs> in fact, most of the people don't even know Europe. If it wasn't for the live map on the Al-Al flight to Israel, we wouldn't even know that Europe even exists. <laughs> because right now, the epicenter of the world is this part of the world. In that time in antiquity, Egypt just went through controlling the world's food. And as Jews, we understand how important that is. And the entire world went through Egypt. The epicenter of civilization was Egypt. The most powerful man. He wasn't a president. He was a dictator. The most powerful man in the world at that time was Paro. He stood as the representative of humanity. And he stared at God and goes, you could be up there, but you're not in here. You can't figure out what blood to give. You can't figure out which houses to hit. If you're going to kill all the animals, you're going to know which animals are Jewish and not Jewish. You're going to bring in all these animals to kill people. You're going to know who's Jewish. You're going to know which blood kids are drink. Are you crazy? You're going to know which kids are firstborn? How in the world do you know that? You know where you exist? You exist up there. And the entire purpose of the Ten Plagues was to do an experiential lesson for the entire world with the most powerful man that I am not just God that lives upstairs. I am God that lives, in Hebrew we say, Bekerev Ha'aret. I am Echad. I am in the world. I know who's the firstborn in the house. I can tell you which animal is Jewish and Egyptian in the same stable. Yeah, I can have the blood. I know the person who drinks that blood, if it's water or if it's blood. I don't just live up there. I'm not just this king. I live here. I live in your life. I live with you. I don't know how this started, but along the way, we've managed to figure out a way to take God and put him up here. I don't know when this started. We think God is there. Where's Hashem? There. What does he do? I don't know. He hangs out probably in Israel. He wants a vacation. He'll go to Hebron. He speaks Hebrew and he wants to like throw it up a drop. He'll throw some Aramaic in there. He spends most of his time with really holy people. But can I tell you one thing? God is not anywhere near my life. Maybe on Yom Kippur. I'll roll in, and if I can just, you know, go through like 30 days of I'm sorry, followed by 10 more days of I'm sorry, and then comes the super fest of I'm sorry, at the end of it, finally God's like, oh, Charlie, I didn't even know you were part of the nation. Can, I, can, I, can you get a little louder? Can you scream a little louder? Can you say sorry a little more? Let me think. Should I put you in? Well, you're not going to get a tzaddik. Let's stop with that for a second. So, you, Benoni or Russia? Benoni or Russia? Mm, okay, fine. You get to live another year. And that's it. See you in a year. Somehow, we've managed to take the creator and stick him up. You ask somebody, where is heaven? You know what they say? Up. Where? Up. Someone dies and goes, where? Up? I don't know. Where do they go? I don't know. Up. There's probably a place that's probably very light. I don't know. There's got to be a pool, right? I mean, there's got to be a pool in heaven, no? There's got to be food. It's a, it's a Jewish place. <laughs> people, think we, 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 people think we die and go to a Pesach program our whole lives. <laughs> and you know what? I'm sure there's bread as well, right? So you know what? We die and we go to a Sephardi Pesach program. Amen. Hey. <laughs> because somehow along the way, we have taken the creator of the world, the greatest thing that we have, the thing that we're here to represent and stuck him up. Guess what? Hashem is not up. There is no up. The sky is up. Hashem, God, is in. He is in the world. Spirituality is not up. Spirituality is in. And everything that we're doing is trying to reveal that which is inside us. In fact, our only real experience of God in this world comes from what's within us. 
God is in our marriages. God is in our children. God is in our work. He is in everything in life. Our job in life is not to look up. Our job in life is looking, and I speak to people who tell me, Charlie, you don't understand. I'm into it, I'm not into it, I'm this religious, I'm this religious, I go to this yeshiva, but I don't feel anything. I come from this background, I don't get anything. And everybody walks around with this thing that they're not, and I tell people all the time, you have no idea who you are. You never have to become spiritual. There's no such thing as a Jew becoming spiritual because you have built into the system more spirituality than you'll ever need your entire life. You are created with a piece of God. That's more than you'll ever be able to access your whole life. You never have to become spiritual. No Jew has far or as close as they could be. Whether they're into it or not, whether they feel it or they're not, no one ever has to become spiritual. It's built into the program. If your eyes are open, you have more spirituality than you can ever access in your lifetime. You don't become spiritual. You reveal spiritual. Just a question of how much you're going to dig in. Just a question of how much you're going to get underneath there. It's all there already. There's no two people that have more or less. When you see someone who's a big guddle, he doesn't have more of Hashem. He just spent his whole life working to reveal himself more. He just spent his whole life trying to access what's inside him already. No one's better than anybody else. No one's more than anybody else. It's just some people are working harder to get it out. And that came into this world in Egypt, which is why God says, if I'm going to have ever, ever one day a year, everyone's going to sit and talk about my, my, my miracles, make it on Passover. Because I want you guys sitting around and telling your kids what I did. Because I don't want your kids thinking, God forbid, that I am just the God of, of Paro. I'm just up there. And you know what? Paro bought it. Hook, line, and sinker. How could he not? He said, okay, go and get me a bracha as well. And you know who else bought it? Everybody bought it. Everybody. When God put the juice through the sea and he split the sea, the measure says that every body of water split as well. Everybody bought it. When later on, when Yoshua, when Joshua sent in spies into Israel and Rachel would say to him, you have to understand something, we all know what happens. The entire world said, hey, wait a second. Some God took these Jews out of Egypt. He came down. Maybe God's in this. Maybe there's a God. Maybe, God. maybe God's in the world. Everybody bought it. Except for one nation. They were living in the south of Gaza. They're called a Malek. And they couldn't handle it. They couldn't stomach it. They couldn't even digest the fact that we're going to have a real understanding of God. So you know what they did? They left their place. We never had a nation come and leave their place. We had nations say that we're in their zones and we're going to overthrow them. We had nations saying they're coming close to our countries. We want to kill them. We had nations telling us that you live in our place. Don't trust them, Haman says. They live in the middle of you. We've had nations say that when we get too close, don't trust the Jews. We have never had a nation say, the Jews are all the way over there. Let's get up and go fight them. And the only goal that Amalek wanted was they didn't want to beat us. You know what they wanted to do? They wanted to just draw blood. That was their goal. As the manager says, they wanted to jump into a hot pool and just cool it off a drop. Because what they wanted to do, they, they knew they couldn't destroy us. We're God's people. God pulls us out of Egypt, we're going to die to Amalek. That wasn't even their goal. Their goal was to just draw blood because if they drew blood, the nations would go, ah, I don't know. You know, I thought this whole Jew thing was working well. But like, they just got difficult. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe Moshe got lucky. They introduce what's called doubt. In Hebrew, it's called suffolk, suffolk. And a mulek has the same numerical value as the gematria of suffolk, because the whole goal of a mulek's existence is relax. You think God's in my life? Relax. Calm down. Did you come back from seminary? Did, you, did Charles just come back from seminary a minute ago? Is he Baruch Hashem me all day? Can you stop at that for a second? Really? Did you say Baruch Hashem like 30 times? Can you chill? Just drop we're, we're, I'm, very, I'm very inspired. It's beautiful. He's not, he's, trust me, he's not my job. Do me a favor. Do me a favor. It's wonderful. I love it. He's a whole, yeah, okay. Stop. Let me tell you how it works in the real world. In the real world, you show up, you pray a little bit, give the rabbi an extra check. You go out in the real world. What goes on outside? Come on. The goal of Amalek is to introduce into our heads that doubt. God's not in my life. God's not in front of me. There's no way God could have brought me that challenge. There's no way God could be with me. God, trust me, I'm not a holy person. I'm not a religious person. I guarantee you, 
that the big God up there is doing way more important things than worrying about my little, insignificant, unholy life. And Amalek, his entire mission is to do just that. And they come at us and they draw blood. And then for the first time ever, what was introduced into this world was doubt. You mess with us, we'll let you live. You mess with our dad, we'll never forget you. So how in the world are we still remembering them for? Why do we bring them right in front of Purim and talk about them? We won. They're over. They're dead. I get it. They did this once a long time ago. It's unfortunate. There's no more Amalek anymore. And the answer is, the truth is, it's still here. Amalek doesn't have any more nations. And they don't have any more people. There's no more ground-to-air missiles of Amalek. But you know what Amalek still is? They've changed themselves from actual individuals fighting us, from ground-to-air missiles, from F-16s that are flying in front of us, to being just a virus. So Amalek right now represents the virus that's inside us. So yeah, we walk around and we're so proud of ourselves. We're walking around as Jews going, look how great we are as a nation. Big shuls, big airplanes, big nation, big army, apps, kosher food, you name it, we own the place. And there's two guys in the headquarters of Amalek on computers going, exactly, exactly, mm-hmm, God's not in your life, I got that. Look how beautiful this family looks, how gorgeous they are, look how wonderful this family is, look how wonderful, they look so nice, look how nice they're dressed. It's amazing, uh-huh, God's not with you, God's not with you either. Yeah, talk about each other that way, destroy each other, uh-huh, in your language, just take these people down. Uh-huh, they look different than you, God, no, no, I love this. Two Jews fighting against each other, this is awesome. God's not in any of you. I got you, and I got you, and I got you, and you can walk around and have wonderfully looking Jews. And in their hearts, there's a virus called Amalek. The virus is God's not in front of me. God's not in the secular world. God's only in shul. And as, as great as we look, and as big as our missiles are, they can sit around and they can take down a nation with just a little bit of virus. Every year God says, don't you walk into my Purim. Don't you walk into Purim until you get in the room. In the room, stand up and remember Amalek. You know why? You think you beat them? (laughs) Wait, you think you beat them? You're so proud of yourselves, really? You think you win? We think like we got this because we can go to Israel or we can learn a little. We think we, let me tell you something. I'll tell you when you beat them, God says. When you see Mashiach, you'll know you beat them. Until then, they're they're still here. But guess what? Don't don't be an Iranian national guard. Don't fall for the easiest trick in the book. You think because they're not flying F-16s, you beat them? They're in the back. They're taking Jews and destroying them. They're taking families and making them, they're telling their family, they're telling regular, wonderful Jewish people that if you don't do these four things, God's not with you. They're the virus that's inside your heart. Stand here, stand up, and remember. It's your job in this world to be a representative of me. Yeah, it sounds crazy to say that God's in my life. That's your job. Root them out. Root them out. Every, you better search your heart and root every aspect out of your heart of that doubt. Because that's why we're here. So why do we do it now for? Because if you know something amazing, every holiday we have has one thing in common. Every holiday, one thing in common. If we have a problem, and God shows up and saves the day. Every holiday. Passover, Pesach, God shows up and saves the day. The next holiday is Shavuos, God showed up and gave us Torah. The next holiday we have is Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, Moshe comes down, God saves the day. Sukkot is the clouds of glory. Even Hanukkah, we come in and God shows up and the miracle of oil. There's only one holiday that we have where God is completely on the surface absent. The story of Purim took place in Shushan. By the way, it could have taken place in any other place in the world. If you remember the story of Purim, basically, it's this one minister that passed the law against the Jews and another minister that got the king to not stop the law, to allow the Jews to defend themselves. I guarantee you throughout our history, this happened a lot of times. One town had a minister that was an anti-Semite, and somebody got the minister to either repeal the law or to defend ourselves. That was the entire story. 
The entire story was, you had Adam Haman, who passed the law, you had a woman named Esther, who got something else in the books, and the Jews got up and defended themselves and lived another day. There's no God, it didn't take place in Israel, Mordechai and Esther aren't even Hebrew names, there's no Yerushalayim, there's no Israel, there's no even mention of God's name, the entire story is 100% secular. And God says, you're going to walk into my holiday, and you're going to look at a holiday. It doesn't put you in shul. It doesn't have you pray. You get to walk around and dress up and drink. And remember a secular story, and you're going to walk through that holiday, and if you're looking at it, you're going to go, where is God here? God didn't show up. God didn't prove a miracle. And God goes, no, 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 you're wearing the wrong glasses. You still got the virus. You come to shul the weekend beforehand, and you remember that inside your heart is a malek. Inside your heart is that person that says, God's not in this world. And if you root out a malek, you're going to walk into Purim, you know what you're going to see? God everywhere. You're going to look at the story and go, wait a second. She dies and she takes over. He happens to be there. The king falls asleep and he gets up in the middle of the night and reads the thing that it's Mordecai and Mordecai shows up. Don't you see God everywhere? And I'm like, what are you talking about? God's nowhere. And you're going to go, what do you mean? Don't you see God everywhere? When you rip out the doubt in your heart that God's in your life, you look at the world with glasses and you see him in everything. And God goes, you want to know what you're supposed to do in Purim? You want to know, the Ariya says, why Purim is the holiest day of the year? Do you want to know, Mishanich Nas Adar, Mar Bim Simcha? Because you know what Simcha really is? You know what it really means to be happy as a Jew? The, the, we, we say, Ein Simcha, Kehataras, Hasfekos. There's no joy than the release of doubt. God goes, you want to know what you're supposed to do in this period of time? You want to know why it's the happiest month of the year? Because it's one month where you get to look around and fight the doubt that I'm in your life. It's awesome to be inspired when we have the moments of inspiration. Who isn't inspired by Yom Kippur? It's awesome to go to Israel for a couple of days and touch the coattail and feel inspired. But guess what? Then you come back to life and you go back to work and you go back to being regular. But can you imagine if you have a holiday who is trying to not take inspiration from the top, who's trying to find inspiration from the ground, if you can find me, God says, in your life, in a regular story, if you can start to get rid of doubt in your life, you know what you get for that? You get something so much deeper. You get the life of meaning. You see me everywhere. You get true happiness. True Jewish happiness is you walk through your life and you spend your life saying, my God is my dad. I don't have to be the most perfect person for my dad. Any parent in the room know what I'm talking about. How many parents have a kid come to you and go, how can you tell me about your day? And the kid goes, because I didn't get an A on the test. I figured you wouldn't want to talk to me. Because why would you talk to me if I don't get an A? And a dad or a mom goes, what are you kidding me? You think I need you to get an A to talk to me? I'm your mom. I want you to tell me everything. And the kid goes, why would you want to hear about all the little things? You go, what are you kidding me? I want to know about the bus rides. I don't want to know about your friends. Is there a parent in the room? that is looking at their kids and going, only if you get A's I want to spend time with you? You know what it means to be a parent? It means that I don't love you if. I love you, period. I love you just because you're mine. I love you when you win and when you fail. I don't need a condition to be in your life. I am your parent. Do you understand the level of torment that a parent would feel if a kid doesn't look up and say, I had no idea. I thought you only loved me when I did well in school. When you look up at God and go, I didn't know you wanted to be, have a relationship. I only thought you were with me when I was being a perfect Jew. I'm not a perfect Jew. You love me as a regular, totally flawed Jew. I can try to be better, but what? And Hashem says, you think I'm just a Malkinu? You think I'm just a king? You don't even get to the king until you get to Avinu. You think I'm just a king? You don't think I'm your dad? Oh, you got the, the Amalek virus. Root that out. Because you can't be my nation. You can't be glowing with godliness if you think I'm only around when you're perfect. Because you're in this earth to, to show people what it means to find God in a boardroom. And what it means to have children and see God in your children. That's the hardness. That's the challenge. That's the opportunity of what it means to be his nation. And the challenge and the happiness rests in the world of regular. And Adar is the month of regular. The holiday is regular. The story is regular. Everything is regular. And if you can find Hashem in regular, 
then you have him forever. When you find that the person that you love loves you and you fail, if you're married and you find that your spouse loves you and you fail, you have that spouse forever. As soon as a kid realizes that mom and dad still love me even though I brought home a bad report card or I failed, I remember as a kid, my, I never felt closer to my mom than when I missed the winning shot to a basketball game. What do I know? I was in sixth grade. I missed the shot. I came home. I couldn't come out of my room. My mom goes, you think I care about this stupid shot? The thought that a kid has that you don't got to oppress your parents because your parents love you no matter what? You know what that feels like for a child? Happiness. Mishenichnas Adar. Marba b'simcha. Maybe that's what we're missing as Jews. Maybe we have everything except for that clarity. Maybe, just maybe, our nation right now has everything, everything, except for one little bit of clarity, that our Father in Heaven loves us no matter what. There's a great rabbi in Israel named Rav Tzvi Meyer. Rav Tzvi Meyer says that if you want to know what will bring and hasten the redemption, it's the fact that we need to impart into our hearts as Godel, Godel the greatness of Ahavas Hashem Lanu, the greatness of God's love for us. Let me end with one story and then I'm done. And you may have heard this before, but I love it. It's my favorite story. I think in Toronto she spoke once. Everyone hear the Devere story? Okay. If you did, thank you for not saying yes. <laughs> I'm going to end with this one thing and then I'll call it a night. In the latest Gaza war, there was a woman who had just lost her husband to a car accident. And about a month after her husband died, her son got called into battle in Gaza. And she was going out of her mind. She, also, she didn't want her son to go. She <clears throat> lost her husband. But what was she going to do? The Israeli army called, and she was a patriot, and she believed in her son to serve the, the army, and he went into battle. And the worst thing happened. About a week into a battle, the army calls her in the middle of the night and says, we have bad news. Your son was killed. And she breaks down. That's it. Her husband dying was close. When her son died, it was it. And she basically said, I'm done living. She gave up everything, and she kept her, locked herself in her apartment for months. She has another daughter, a son and a daughter. Her daughter called her. She said, Ma, come out. Ima, come out. I'm not coming out. Ima, I have children. You have grandchildren. They miss, they miss their sata. She goes, I'm not coming out. I'm not living. I don't, God doesn't love me. I'm out. I'm out. No. Lock the door. A week, five weeks, six weeks, two months. You can't blame her. Two months later, one of her friends said to her, listen, there's a big rabbi coming to town. Just listen to the class. She goes, I'm not listening to rabbis. I'm not doing anything. I'm living my life in this house with the lights off forever. She goes, please, come to the class. She comes to the class and the rabbi speaks about God being in your life. And she's like half nodding through it. She comes home that night and she turns, she sits down in her house and she looks up to heaven. She says, God, you took my, my husband and you took my son. I understand we make sacrifices for this land. I get that. But I want to know that my son is okay. Her son's name was Devere. I want to know that my, I understand that he died, and he died for you and for your nation, and I'm okay with that. That's what happens when you send your kids into the army. You take that risk. But I want to know that my Devere is okay. And here's the deal I make with you, God. You can't do this, but you did. I'll know that you're taking care of him, and I'll be okay with it. But I want to give my Devere one more hug. I want my Devere. One more hug. You give me a hug with my Devere, I'm good. She said that then. Okay. True story. This is going on. I'm, 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 the, lady, the lady spoke in Toronto. Two weeks later, she has a call from her daughter. She says, Sat Ima, it's almost Tu Bishvat. There's a, a um, uh, Tu Bishvat get together. You know, in Israel, they, 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 they have the fruits and the whole deal. You have two grandkids. They missed their safta. Come on, please. She goes, okay. I'll come to the Tu Bishvat get together. She goes to some area, and they have nuts, and the kids are playing. It's gorgeous. It's in Israel, the harvest. It's awesome. Kids are running around. And she walks over, and she's sitting around, and she's a nursery school teacher. So when you're a nursery school teacher, kids come to you. You know what I'm talking about? Any nursery school teacher? You know what I'm talking about? Like the little moras? 
are like magnets for kids. You know what I'm talking about? You could have like a, a mora somewhere and like every kid's like, mora, 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 mora. You know what I'm talking about? That's what mora's are. God bless them. They're the greatest people in our nation. Somehow, mora's and candy men are like the greatest people we have. So she's a mora. She takes care of little kids. She used to before she quit. So some little two-year-old comes running over and starts like hanging out on her leg. And she's like, who's this kid? So she's like playing with them a little bit and all of a sudden, like, you know, the, 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 her, the mom comes over to, like, try to pull the kid away, and the kid won't go, and she's playing with him. And she's like, oh, it's okay, I'm a mower, I'm okay. And she's seeing her grandkids in the distance, and this little kid's literally attached to the, to the ledge. And this mom looks like she just can't get it together. This poor mom looks like she's totally over She's got a kid in her little pouch, and the kid is just crying and screaming and snotty and crying and losing it. And her two-year-old attacking some stranger, and the mom is like pulling her hair out, and she's she's telling this kid, get off her leg, leave the gavaret alone, and she, he's just hanging out there, and she goes, it's okay, it's okay, and she's losing it, and she goes, and and the mom goes, listen, give me the crying baby, I'm a safta, I've done this before, I'll take you to handle the kid wants a toy or something, a carob tree, I don't know what they want. <laughs> so she takes out, she she takes out the baby. And she hands it to this woman. And the second she hands it to this woman, the baby stops crying. Like as if like she, but grandmothers have that touch. She's a Bobby soft of grandma, wherever you are. And she's just rocking and the kid's like Googling at her. And she's like, in, oh. And the mom looks, she goes, you know, I feel like the kid likes you better than me. And she takes care of this two-year-old and she goes, she's cooing him and she goes, well, what's his name? And the mom goes, his name is Devere. She goes, Devere, that was her son's name who died. She goes, Devere, what a strange name. Why would you name him Devere? And she says, well, I'll tell you, it's a crazy story. When I was pregnant with him a few months ago, the doctor called and said they got some tests back and he was gonna come out, if alive at all, incredible, it would have been a disaster. They weren't sure if he'd make it, if he was a viable kid, uh, fetus. And if, if, he, he did get, if he was born, he would be born with so many complications, he'd spend the rest of his life in a hospital. And I was broken. And I went home that night and I prayed to Hashem and I said, Hashem, please, I want to raise the kid, make him healthy. And that night I saw on television that there was in the Gaza war, a casualty of war. There was a man named Devir who just died. And I said, Hashem, if he comes out healthy, I'm going to name him Devir in memory of that soldier. And this mom is giving her Devere one last hug. You see, if this would happen once, it'd be cool. I did a video two weeks ago about thank you, Hashem. Some of you may have seen this before. I got a hat. You know what's amazing? I did this thing. I, went, I missed my friend's wedding. And I spent the whole day saying thank you, Hashem. And at night, I got a package. Can I tell you something amazing? Since that video went out, I think I got a hundred calls and texts from people with their own story of Hashem just showing up. Their own little Devere stories. You know why? Because when there's a big story out there, everybody knows. But we don't know of the little stories. They don't make it to the news. Now with Instagram, apparently it does. It's a new thing. <laughs> so we think that God is big. And we never meet enough people to get everyone in the room so we could all realize that Hashem's not big. Hashem is also right with us. All of our little mices, our stories, they never make it. So we don't know that millions of people have their Devere stories. Because God is not just Elokeinu, He is Echad. He's Bekerev Haaretz. He is mine and your dad. And can I tell you something? As much as you think you're not worthy of Him, that's not how parenting works. If you have Rachmanis on your children, you can guarantee God has more mercy on you. And maybe our job in this world is to stand up and to start to look for him. To stop waiting for some major miracle to be inspired and to start seeing him in everything that we're doing. Maybe our job is to see God in our regular lives and to point him out and to feel his embrace Maybe our job is not anymore to be big. Maybe it's to be small. Maybe it's to be a little light on ourselves 
and our nations. Maybe it's not to use F-16s. Maybe it's just to start to clear out the virus in our hearts. So that if we have children that they don't have that virus, and we have friends that don't have that virus, and we go to work and walk our days, people look at us and go, there's something about this person. I don't know what it is about them. They just walk with God. Maybe our job is to finally stand up and fight a Amalek. To live as Purim Jews. Because Yom Kippur doesn't come. Purim comes all the time. Every once in a while he opens the world, but not anymore. Maybe, just maybe. If we became those people, who knows? When they call us for the technology conferences, and they say, I brought you down because you know what you do for a living? You work for God. You could look at them and go, you know, I may look like a doctor and a lawyer and a mom and a nurse, but you're absolutely right. You know who I work for? I work for my dad. Because too many people think that my dad only loves a few righteous people. And I'm on this earth to show everybody that he's in my life, so he's probably in your life too. So it looks like I'm a regular person, but you know who I work for? I work for the company. I work for the man. And that should be the greatest gift that we give him, and we give ourselves. And if we live like that, I think in my heart, we'd walk around, we'd have good days and bad days, but it wouldn't matter because at the end of the day, we'd walk around and I think we would touch the true measure of Simcha. And it is my blessing to this holy, holy crowd that when it comes time for God to reveal himself in the world and Mashiach comes here, my blessing is that each and every one of you should stand in line and when you meet him, he should tell you, thank you for bringing me. God should tell us in a time where nobody knew I was there, thanks. Thanks for being one of my few soldiers that walked the streets and brought me into the regular world. Thank you for not just believing that I'm up in the world, but thanks for continuing the legacy of your great-grandparents and believing that I'm not just there, that I'm here. Thank you for living not just Shema Yisrael Hashem Lokeinu, but thank you for living Hashem Echad. We should be zochah to see those days where Hashem reveals ourselves, and we should be zochah. We should have the good fortune of standing tall, standing proud, being his child, and living a life of true, true godliness and true, true happiness. Thank you very much.